So welcome to the Moth Identification Tips Session 1. The photographs you'll see at the start of the sessions don't really bear any relevance to what we're going to discuss. They're just really nice photographs of some moths. And here's a lovely white spot moth, um, as we are courtesy of the uh, support funding, etc., via the Pence Magnificent Moths Project. What better moth to show than the white spot moth, um, one of the campion group, that uh, is most common in this country at Dungeness, where it flies in huge abundance from time to time over the flowers of Nottingham French fly, which is its uh, caterpillar's food plant. So a very beautiful moth and well worth a trip to Dungeness and a few other sites along the south coast if you want to see it. Right, so before we start going into the identification, um, these talks arose as a uh, you know, first time round during the first lockdown. And in order to keep hmm, staff at BC and indeed wider mothing world happy, I decided I'd kind of do some identification sessions and moving around the country looking at moth traps. And that was great. But actually, in hindsight, there are things that I needed to do to begin with. And I think having a bit of a kit list is actually probably quite a good idea to be able to lift you to the point at which you go, oh, I now know what I can do. Megan has very kindly already given a plug for the field guides in which I've been um, heavily involved. And of course, there's the field guide to the macromoths of uh, Great Britain and Ireland, the Waring and Townsend, which we all know. But please don't forget Chris Manley's guide because the Field guides, they uh, are all using, pretty much all using Richard Lewington's wonderful illustrations. Chris Manley's guide uses photographs, and the two together are a wonderful adjunct. And I really do uh, strongly, I use photographs and uh, Richard's illustrations all the time, and, and I think it's a great way to do it. The next thing are the websites and identification apps. Um, websites, I think we're all fairly familiar with, identification apps are beginning to take hold. They're certainly very good for a, a lot of butterflies and macromoths, a little bit less good for micromoths for now, but that will be, the you know, micromoths will rapidly be catching up. So the apps that I tend to use are OBS Identify, Google Lens, and um, and C. Um, and they come up with some remarkably good matches with with the moths and very i mean i have to say very rarely get it wrong so if you're at all interested in going down the app line i mean don't use that as just that's the first thing you do is pop it in the app try and learn how to identify the moth and check with the app to see if that's correct the next thing is a digital camera whether it's your digital camera or whether it's a, a it's a decent camera phone um, whatever it is, is we're all able to take photographs these days. And that I think really helps because in order to be able to, if you've caught something cracking that you think nobody will believe, if you've got a photograph of it and you can post it on Facebook or X, then you've got a reasonable chance of effectively some uh, proud sourced identification. And if then you're able to say, well, I put it on Facebook, send it to your county recorder, everybody said that this is what it is, you're likely to have a record accepted, even if it's something cracking and completely outlandish. So digital camera, really important than digital phone. I'll come on to the neutral gray background in a minute, but the background that you take your photograph on is actually quite important for a number of species, not all of them, uh, but for quite a number of them, the color of the background makes a huge difference uh, because of the, the way that digital cameras work. The next thing you need is a clear pot or several clear pots at a fridge, of course, to keep the moths quiet. The reason you need a clear pot is because you're not just going to be looking at the four-wing characters. There are actually plenty of characters that you will be looking at over the next four weeks um, that involve using the underside of the four wings and the hind wings. So when you've got the four wing characters and the undersides, then, then you've got a, a combination of, of characters and having combinations of characters gives you the confidence to know what you're identifying. 
I think most of the time you can get away with a hand lens. Absolutely fine. Low power binocular microscope. They're not particularly expensive these days, but I, I personally find them useful as I'm uh, getting on a bit and, um, and eyes quickly tire if I'm using a hand lens a lot. So low power binocular microscope, very useful, but a hand lens is perfectly okay. And then this last piece of kit is, is something that I have developed since lockdown. And it's a soda stream or an equivalent way of delivering a shot of carbon dioxide. Because carbon dioxide will very temporarily knock moths out for 10, 15 seconds, just enough for you to be able to pop a little pencil under the forewing and, and lift it up and have a look at the hind wing color or turn it over and be able to get a photograph of it without the moth flapping around and disappearing. So if you happen to have a soda stream, then if, if you ever try you know, producing this fizzy water from it, you'll know that the, the gas, the CO2 comes out at very high pressure. It's also extremely cold. And if you put high pressure and cold, you will freeze and destroy the moth that you're trying to, to look at. So please use about a half meter long piece of PVC tubing. And when you then discharge the CO2, it comes out at a perfectly steady jet that's at reasonably room temperature. And then I use a little medical tube, which has already got gauze set in the top, but you could easily make your own out of a piece of uh, kind of neck curtaining over a, over a tube. And then, then with the nozzle, just let the CO2 in for, oh, two or three seconds, something like that. And you'll see the moth just kind of calmly peel over. And then you can tip it out onto a piece of paper, do the manipulation, and then literally within 15 or 20 seconds more, that moth will be back up again and ready to go off on and do its thing. So it's a very temporary uh, stunning of the moth in order to help you identify. I found this a real help. Anyway, back to digital photography, why background matters. Um, I don't know how many of you saw a, uh, I suppose this would be about last October, October 23, where there was a bit of a flurry on Facebook, possibly also on X, um, where uh, there was a discussion around funny looking oak hook tips uh, that seem to be arriving in the West Country, particularly in the uh, Bristol Channel area, uh, South Wales across to Keltenham and down into Bristol. Um, and these have turned out to be spiny hook tip moths. Now, spiny hook tip, I was on the Channel Islands last July and I found the spiny hook tip there. And it's so, so closely related to oak hook tip but it's really hard to identify. And if you look at the two photographs lined up on the left, you can see the color of the forewings looks pretty similar. They look a kind of a, a lovely orangey brown. That's the color against those particular backgrounds. So if you look at the same moth on the right hand side, um, then you'll see that against a neutral gray background color, um, you'll see that the spiny hook tip at the top that takes on a very sort of gray wash to the forewings. And the oak hook tip below at the bottom on the right, that still look quite orangey brown. And that is a key diagnostic feature to tell the two species apart. You could not tell from the top left photograph that that moth has got a gray wash to the forewing. But as soon as you put it on a neutral background, you can. So. Digital photography, we think of it as brilliant and convenient, but actually sometimes it deceives our eyes. And it's it's uh, so the background that you photograph the moth on can matter a great deal. And it certainly did for the spiny hook tip records, which appear to have been turning up in this country probably for the last two years, since certainly since 2021. Most of those are photographed against a... Uh, 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 some sort of a background that isn't neutral gray. And so they're really hard to tell whether they are oak hook tip or spiny hook tip. But just as we can get into an identification session, I am now going to tell you the difference. So we've got spiny hook tip on the left and um, oak hook tip on the right. And if we look at um, the spiny hook tip on the left, if you're looking at the hook tip, that's the clue, 
this is the bit that you want to concentrate on here and here. And you can see that in the spiny hook tip, most examples, not all of them, have got two black dots, one thick big one there, and one slightly smaller one here. But in the um, oak hook tip, we've just got a, a sort of fuzzy blackish or dark brownish um, uh, sort of suffusion across the uh, below the, the sort of the lower half of the apex of the wing. Let me just get rid of those for you. And the other really key feature that's usually present on, on spiny hook tip is this white which, that sits above the black mark, okay, which is not present on, on oak hook tip. So if you're out there thinking, have I been overlooking a spiny hook tip, or you are currently living in the West Country or in South Wales, just have a look at if you've got some, any of your photographs of the oak hook tip and spiny hook tip, just to see if you might have um, any among your photos. Now, what's really kind of interesting is that the oak hook tip, which is um, a species that's distributed um, throughout England and Wales, it doesn't get as far north as Scotland and it doesn't get into Ireland. Well, it does, it does. Actually, there are some Scottish records. There are very few Scottish records in, in Dumfries and Galloway, but it's, it's pretty much an England Wales thing. It's got two generations a year. So it appears in the springtime in May and June, and again towards the end of July and into August. The spiny hook tip appears in April and May and then late June and into July, and again in September and through into October. And that seems to be the case even in Britain. So here's a species that appears to have moved north in Southern Europe, uh, up the Western Atlantic seaboard, probably from Spain, Portugal, up the uh, through through the Loire Atlantic and, and up to towards the, it's certainly in the Channel Islands, but it's not present in central France. Um, and it seems to have crossed the channel pretty easily into, into Britain. And my guess is that this is going to become thoroughly established in the milder areas of southwestern Britain, the West Country, and into Wales. Um, and if you do catch one in well into October, that really is about a month too late for any hook dip to appear. Even, you know, they just almost never do a third breed of um, oak hook dip. So a very, very late specimen. If you look at your photos and see a very late one, it could easily be spiny. Right, now there we, let's get on with some more spring things because hook tips will be a while before they're out. One thing that I would strongly encourage you to do is to get out and as soon as the sallow blossoms are out and they're out, it's just starting now in Southern England, Go out there with a with a torch and shine it up into the male pins. Those are the bright yellow ones. Particularly if during the day, you've seen that there are bumblebees, maybe peacocks and brimstones feeding on on the nectar. That means that night, those that same bush will be ripe enough for lots of moths to come to it. The best place to find lots of moths on on the willow catkins, sallow catkins, is in a woodland. And when you do so, you get lots and lots of Quakers coming there and you'll be able to see their eyes reflecting in the torchlight. And then you'll go, well, how am I going to get them down? The favoured technique is to put a couple of old bed sheets out underneath the sallow bush and whack the branches with a cudgel or with some sort of a walking stick. And the moths fall off from where they've been feeding a little bit drunk, actually. And, and they will sit there while you can count them up. And I have to say, on sallow blossom, this is easily more effective than a moth trap. If, on the other hand, you do want to use a moth trap, then put your moth trap in a woodland right next to a sallow bush that's in full flower, because it will have loads more moths in it in the morning than does one somewhere else in the woodland. If you really want to see lots of moths, then put it near a sallow bush. It's the real magnet attractor of moths in the spring um, at the night. Just, just to remind us that we can do the same at the other end of the season. Of course, ivy blossom is a really important nectar source for moths in the mid to late autumn. And um, again, a torch going out at night when the ivy blossom is particularly ripe is is great fun. And you find all sorts of moths, particularly those that you wouldn't necessarily see at your moth trap. 
Right, back to Quakers and drabs and things like that. Let's get into some identification. We're, we're, we're going to start on the lower slopes this evening. Um, we'll get to more tricky stuff. There'll be some tricky stuff tonight, but we'll get to trickier stuff in the in the in the later sessions. So worry worry not if you're uh, if this isn't isn't quite doing it for you. But we're trying to get everybody into into the groove. So small Quaker and blossom underwing. Here are two species that, on the face of it, look pretty similar when you look at their forewings. But I think instantly you can see that small Quaker is genuinely quite a small moth in comparison with blossom underwing. And we'll come to the underwing bit in a minute. But they are quite similar in their colour. So uh, that uh, sort of orangey brown sting over the top of a of a kind of a greyish ground. Um, uh, but the, the forewing is very definitely broader in the blossom underwing, so there than than the than the uh, small Quaker. So so if you see a large, it's basically an overall larger moth. But it's not just that the um, the, the the apex. So that's the, the the apex of the wing is rather rounded in the um, in the small Quaker, and and the much more angular. Um, oh, sorry, a much more angular mark in the it, a shape in the uh, blossom underwing. So you can see to make sure that you're looking at the right thing. Don't just casually overlook a blossom underwing by mistake as being, oh, that's a slightly large, small Quaker. A wing shape could trigger in your mind that, that here's a small Quaker that's a bit big, that has got a bit more of a pointed wing. Okay. So the other character here is if you look to see where the cross lines are, so these are the lines that run from the uh, leading edge of the wing to the um, trailing edge of the wing, um, you can see in uh, the blossom underwing that they're quite well marked, slightly angular, and in the small Quaker they don't exist at all. So look for the um, cross lines and you can see effectively that there is a, a central band in a blossom underwing that happens to be rather darker. And um, that should give you a pretty good clue that you're into blossom underwing. Right. The other thing to do is to look at the underwing. The clue is in the name, the blossom underwing, the white spring blossom of the white underwing of the blossom underwing. Pretty obvious. Um, Pretty obvious, but you try doing that with a live specimen out in the field on in, in a moth trap, and it's extremely difficult. And this is the sort of occasion when it, I find it really helpful just to use a small amount of carbon dioxide just to, to knock the moth out for a, you know 10, 15 seconds. You can just lift that hind wing easily without you know, affecting the moth and, and just check that it has got a white hind wing. So, uh, so, and then that becomes pretty obvious. So there's a couple of speeches that, you know, in effect should be relatively straightforward to uh, to identify. But certainly from my point of view, when I first started recording, I was always worried I was overlooking some underwing among small Quaker. But in the end, when you see one, you go, oh, yes, I think I do know. Right. Now we'll come on to more Quakers and drabs. These are all out in the next, well, they'll be starting. I'm a Quaker's already out now. I suspect somebody will tell me, probably pop it in the chat, that they've had uh, clouded drab um, already. Um, Northern drab and lead-coloured drab, I guess, probably not out yet. But all of these are going to be out fairly soon. Northern drab, most on most occasions, is actually quite a late species. It's around in sort of mid-April through to mid-May. But actually, last year, I saw an example that was out at right at the end of March. So... I wouldn't say that's a that's a given, and and uh, so I think all of these species could be around from now all the way through to well, sort of mid May time. Common Quaker, as the name suggests, is our is a really common moth. So we're going to be able to see lots of those uh, wherever we're trapping, whether that's an urban environment, scrub, or woodlands. Uh, there'll be lots of them, um, and it's a very standard sort of shape and color. Common Quaker exists in this sort of um, uh, reddish brown, and whether it's a pale grayish 
reddish brown or whether it's a mid reddish brown that's the pretty much the range of variation sometimes the, the reddish is pretty much gone so you can have a grayish brown very often the two stigmata that's the um the the oval that's there and the uh and the kidney shaped stigmata are, uh, are, are, are elided so they're joined and uh, and so that's a that's quite characteristic but not absolutely diagnostic of of common quaker and you can see perhaps in lead colored drab where they are not elided um and that's it's another characteristic for lead colored drab but let's just hop from common quaker over to lead colored drab um lead colored drab you think well actually it does look pretty similar to um uh, a common quaker but actually the lead colored gives it away if lead color means gray gray but with a little bit of reddish on it um lead color drab is a very local species so you're, you're very unlikely to turn it up in big numbers unless you're moth trapping uh, in the right place which is in aspen woodlands uh, sometimes also uh, occasionally on white poplar but it's usually associated with aspen woodlands so i'm down here in dorset and it's extremely local perhaps three or four spots in the county only where there's a reasonable growth of aspen as you move further north and get into scotland where aspen is really quite a common tree particularly in um, in speyside then that moth is quite common and there will be other places east anglia for instance breckland where where um a lead color drab is is quite common but it's a gray moth okay it's not it's not got a form that's uh, yellowish brown or reddish brown and indeed the scottish ones this this lower example here this example you can see is a really quite a deep late gray with some lovely reddish markings on it that's pretty typical of lead color drab in scotland and sadly i will be going on about just how uh, wonderful Scottish moths are at this time of the year or coming up in the spring. The the weird and wonderful forms of Scottish moths uh, and forms of those in comparison with those in England and Wales. Um, so northern drab is a species that has uh, is characterized by being about the same size as a common Quaker, but it's got a really straight leading edge to the wing. So um, you'll see that just sticks in your mind and it's got quite a straight uh, outer edge to the wing and so it's got overall this moth looks pointed wing and compare that with the common quaker which is rather more rounded and the lead colored drab rather more rounded and so to pick out as a first blush is you're looking for those with leading edge that's got a really straight line and um, then the center band in the northern drab is often, not always, rather darker. So it's got a rather dark central band in the middle there. It's often got a contrastingly pale gray thorax. And then the subterminal line, that's the line just in from the, um, the, the, the outer edge, is straight and nicely faded on the inside i'll just get rid of all those annotations so you can see it's a white line with quite a nice bit of dark fading towards the base and it's got a pink before it gets towards the apex of the wing so it's really a nice sharp angular moth about the size of a common quaker and indeed leg colored drab it is significantly smaller than the clouded drab which is probably the species with which it is most readily confused but clouded drab is just a bigger moth and it doesn't really have that broad dark band however there are some forms of northern drab which don't really have the the center band you're still looking for this you can see in that top black specimen there that really sharp apex to the wing so a very straight leading edge and and a really sharp cut back uh, outer edge to the wing and that is is uh, you know it it screams at me northern drab despite the fact that it's a fairly plain looking moth the plainer forms of northern drab um 
they they can occur anywhere, but if anything, they're probably most common um, in the salt marshes of North Kent and South Essex and Suffolk, um, where there's a salt marsh form of northern drab, and those are really quite plain looking. So, I mean, I've I've not seen them in the flesh, but um, but they are. Uh, um, I would say they are more difficult to identify. They're also a slightly more brownish look to them. But, uh, but you're still looking for that very straight leading edge of the wing. Right. Now, after all of this, there are some other key feature, one other key feature that will be critical for making sure you've got at least the male lead colored drab. And that's to look at how tenated or feathered the antenna is. In common Quaker, the antenna is filiform. It doesn't have any particular pectinations, any branches on it. And the same for clouded drab. But when you look at lead colored drab, can you see there the lead colored drab? That's really nice and quite feathered. And that is at least for the male, because obviously the female doesn't have feathers on it. So if you have got something you think is a lead colored drab, look and check the sex of it, turn over the object, look at the look at the underside of your pot and, and see what shape the abdomen is, and if the abdomen's big and fat, it's going to be a female, and the antenna character won't work. If it's relatively thin and very slightly splayed at the end, that will be a male, and then you can encourage the antenna to, to, to display, or you may be able to see it even at rest down by the wings, and you should be able to see that it's feathered. So that should be a way of separating common Quaker, northern drab, red colour drab, and rounded drab hopefully. Right, moving on. Um, next. Okay, so um, I don't know whether other county recorders have found it, but I've certainly come across quite a few records of common Quaker being recorded into late June. And this is not just the odd example, which I, I suppose could be right, but actually these are numbers of examples. And I've been a bit Critical about well, wonder what it is that recorders are recording out there. And my hunch is that people are recording us. A very few people, I must be, are recording vines rustic. We all get to see lots and lots of common Quaker in the spring, and I think there's a bit of a tendency to kind of continuing recording them because it's easy just to tick the list and on they go. But if we look at the brilliant um, 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 the Atlas, the Atlas of Britain and Ireland's uh, larger moths uh, produced by butterfly conservation, then we can look at the flight period. And I really do, if you haven't got this book, then please, 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 the, the, the Moth Atlas, as it's known, is absolutely invaluable. It gives you pretty much a very good idea of what the flight time is in these, in these flight period maps. And you can see that, you know, in the last... Well, it'll be probably it won't be any different now. So pretty much in the last 25 years, the end of the first week of June is the last date at which you would realistically find the odd common Quaker. So if somebody is finding common Quaker in mid to late June and in small numbers, then that's the time when you go, I must take a photograph and check that that's right. My guess, and looking at the light period for Vines Rustic, which is in or even past its peak, um, in in uh, mid June, that's probably what's being recorded. So we all get a bit kind of you know black a days ago about things and 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 uh, and to sort of tick what's there and hope that's probably right. But actually, we need to be very sure about what we're recording. So we don't artificially, in the National Moth Recording Scheme database, skew these light period um, uh, graphs, which are ever so important for our understanding of of what's happening with flight periods. And you can see, for instance, under common Quaker, just how there's been a shift towards the beginning of the year in the peak flight time, and indeed the emergence period of common Quaker. And I'm sure, probably, I mean, I've certainly seen uh, one common Quaker um, that was around in very early January this year. We had an exceptionally mild um, winter, if rather too wet, and the old common Quaker is already turning up um, so I suspect that graph will be shifting down towards January as the years go by. Right. Next Quaker. 
Um, powdered Quaker. I don't think there will be many of us here interested in Powdered Quaker who will struggle to identify a couple of Powdered Quakers looking like that. This moth is a lovely pale colour, beautifully powdered, just slightly, slightly pepper and salt, isn't it? Slightly sort of um, wood in these dark flecks. There is a however, and that is Every now and again, you might just see, but in, in, in particular habitats, one looking like this. That is another powdered Quaker. I only wish I had got an at-rest example to show you. These powdered Quakers really oddly come from a particular food plant. I don't think I understand the mechanism, but if the caterpillar of the... Um, powdered quaker feeds on bog myrtle, then they then they tend to produce this um, really odd reddish brown or reddish brown mixed grey um, uh, fore wing uh, in in the in the powdered quaker, and it's quite bizarre. And I think if you just saw that in a moth trap with everything else, you wouldn't instantly think powdered quaker. So where is that moth going to occur? Um, the, on the uh, the bogs of the Dorset Heaths at Studland, the New Forest, um, Surrey Heaths, and then um, it, wherever there's bog myrtle growing through to um, through to the uh, Fenland, so Norfolk and Suffolk, um, Sutton Fen, Catfield Fen, those sorts of places. What I'm not quite sure about is what happens in Scotland. Um, somebody might need to post that in the chat. As do you get this form of Powdered Quaker, or does even Powdered Quaker occur in Scotland? I have forgotten for a minute. Bear with me while I just get a crib and find out. Um, we have got Quakers. Here we go. Powdered Quaker. Oh, well, it certainly does occur in Scotland. It wouldn't be at all surprised that that form does occur in Scotland because there's plenty of bog myrtle up there. Right. Next, clouded drab and twin spotted Quaker. Some of you may say, does it really matter that we get these absolutely right? If you look at the top two forms, so that top row, the clouded drab and that twin spotted Quaker, they actually look remarkably similar. And you can even see in this clouded drab, there's a sort of twin spot, as opposed to a proper twin spot in the twin spotted Quaker. But what is that sort of twin spot? It's actually a smudge. It kind of is a twin spot, but it's a twin smudge. And that's the difference when you get them between clouded drab and twin spotted Quaker is the smudge. Um, uh, so twin spotted Quaker, I always think, is just even that little bit bigger than clouded drab. But there is there are overlapping forms, and it is easy to get them uh, muddled up. Um, you can see that twin spotted Quaker sometimes, rather than having jet black dots, has rather reddish dots in that lower right photograph. And um, there are even more interesting ones that do occur. So here's the clouded drab in the middle row at the bottom, where that Mudge, you've got a very, very pale. This is a Scottish form, this one. Very, very pale um, uh, uh, smudge dot there. Um, and the equivalent in a twin spotted Quaker is still a pair of dots. So the difference between the two is definitely smudge and dots, in my view. But then again, the odd twin spotted Quaker will turn up with absolutely nothing. No dots whatsoever, just a plain form. Now, what would you record that as? Well, I'll leave that to you, but it should be been spotted Quaker. We can tell by looking at, yet again, the Antani. If it's a male, we get away with it because clouded drab, as we saw in the last slide, has straight antenna, when spotted Quaker has feathered antennae. So, unless it's a female, in which case you're going to struggle, then we can definitely separate out powdered drab and twin spotted quaker if they've got something odd about the spotting of where we expect to see the twin spots. Okay, okay. So I hope that will have sorted weird powdered quakers, powdered drab and twin spotted quaker. Right, Hebrew character. I don't suppose there are many of you who think, why is he 
well, who can really confuse Hebrew character with anything else. We might misrecord it late in, in, the, in the spring for Natasha's Hebrew character and tick the wrong box. But other than that, Hebrew character is 100%. That's what it looks like. There's a little bit of variation in this part of the world in southern England, but otherwise, it's pretty standard stuff. Go north of the border and into Scotland and things weird happen. Um, and I'd love to show you live examples, but sadly at the moment I've only got some set examples, but look at these. Those have to be some of the weirdest looking um, Hebrew characters I've ever seen. But that's not an uncommon, all those two forms are not uncommon in, in Scotland, particularly in Speyside. Um, uh, and at this time of the year, uh, just coming up, I suppose, into March, once the willows are out, um, if you do, ah, oh, go up the old A9 into the Spey Valley with a couple of bed sheets in the back and stop off in an old lay-by somewhere where there's an overhanging willow and give it a boot onto the sheet and you will definitely find a whole load of ordinary Hebrew characters and quite a few of these remarkable forms of them among them. Fantastic. And I, I, one day I must be up there to go and photograph them myself. They are amazing and um, a, a, a wonderful species to see. And it just shows, I suppose, how very isolated um, uh, parts of Scotland have been, at least genetically isolated from the rest of, um, rest of Britain uh, to maintain this huge variation. And Scotland is a really amazing place for moths. Um, most of the year, but but particularly in the spring, the colour forms and the variation um, are fantastic. And just to continue that, because I've just got to indulge you a little bit, pebble hook tip. Pebble hook tip will be out in May, um, and uh, I think we can all recognise pebble hook tip. I don't suppose many of us have got any problem with it. But go to Scotland, we can still identify it, but it's a it's a fabulous form of it. Look at that. It's Stunningly dark, has this wonderful, wonderful dark chocolate brown blackish uh, streak across the wing and this wonderful black apex to, to the wings. It's a fabulous moth. So you, know, you can be running your trap down here and then go up to Scotland and run a trap out there. And at times you will struggle to, to, to think, what is the moth I'm looking at? And we'll come across a number of those in the next few lectures where there is a Scottish form you need to know about because it does look very different from the ones that we see in the rest of England and Wales. And while we're talking about Scottish moths, let's just move into uh, red sword grass and sword grass. Um, red sword grass is not particularly Scottish these days. It's uh, certainly, if anything, I think it's doing rather better across the whole of England and Wales. In Scotland than it was perhaps 20 years ago. Swordgrass, on the other hand, is a very rare moth and it's always a delight to see it even in Scotland. And again, coming to the atlas, to the moth atlas, we can see, well, you can see it's not very large, but um, you can see that the swordgrass moth has basically got a western distribution from sort of Hampshire across the southwest into Wales, northern England and into Scotland and across most of Ireland. Whereas sword grass, if you're looking for the blue dots, the darker blue dots, then they tend to be Scotland only, Isle of Man a bit. But just very occasionally, they turn up on the south coast of England. And there's certainly been two in the last decade on the, at the Portland Bird Observatory. And I guess that there are people who know of records of uh, sword grass moth that have turned up. So how do we know how to tell sword grass and dark sword grass, red sword grass, sorry, red sword grass, as the name suggests, is a bit redder. But if that moth has got a bit worn, it's also, I always think of when you look at a red saw grass from the top, you're looking at this quite dark, uh, sort of rather very dark brown sort of centre to the, to the wings, almost like a, a, a dash in the middle of the wings. Um, but it's, but you know, by the time that's worn off in the early spring, that's not very helpful to you. Well, one sure fire way to identify these moths is to forget the wings and look at the leg. The legs of the red sword grass, and we're talking about the, the tarsi. So that's not the whole leg, that's the tip of the leg. Right at the end here. 
there, and you can see another one there. Um, the tips of the of the legs are definitely, definitely chocolate brown. The tips of the legs in sword grass are pale. Okay. Now, sometimes you can see here there's a little bit of dark that's extended down the leg of the sword grass, but if you concentrate on the tips, you won't go wrong. Um, sometimes the sword grass legs are almost all whitish, but sometimes they've also got some color, but the tips are uh, of the legs always enable you to separate out red sword grass from sword grass. So there we go. Good luck finding them. What a splendid moth to see. I've already seen one's red sword grass um, on the Dorset coast this year. Um, it's a fabulous moth. It looks just like a, a twig. And it's a bit like the buff tip in that, uh, I mean, these ones you can see at rest. They're deliberately showing the legs because that's the key way of separating them. But when they are fully at rest, the legs are tucked in to the abdomen and the moth rolls over as if a bird is uh, turning over the leaves and turning over twigs so that it doesn't uh, it doesn't lose its disguise by showing a leg. Uh, so the uh, so the red sawgrass can well, sawgrass can survive by looking amazingly like twigs. I just get rid of those annotations. Okay, while we're on sword grasses, let's just do the other one among the three species of early migrating noctuids. So these are species when you put your moth trap out, you'll be expecting quakers and rabs and things like that. And every now and again, oof, something else will turn up. And this year, turnip and dark sword grass have been moving up from, we've had one or two uh, periods of um, dust storms coming up from, from uh, north, northwestern Africa. And those have brought with them a few interesting moths, including a few striped hawks. Um, but they will also bring with them turnip, dark sword grass, and very often early underwing. And I don't know about you, but I certainly found when I was into moths at a very early age, I did struggle at least with turnips and pearly underwings getting them right. I think dark sword grass is okay. The sword grass bit is fine because the swords are these black marks in the wing, which the other two species don't have. So um, they're fairly easy to do, but you will also find some sword grass that have come up from Southern Europe or North Africa that are pretty washed out and therefore they won't really have those. So there are other things we need to look for. So the things we need to look for here is that the pearly underwing, if it's in a decent example, it's a bit two-tone. So the leading edge of the wing tends to be darker and the railing edge tends to have a sort of a paler patch to it. It tends to be just that bit paler. But the easiest way to look for it is to look at the, rather than the wings, is to look at the thorax. Because the thorax of the um, pearly underwing has got a kind of mohican. It's got, it's got a tuft of erect scales on it here. So if you look at it in profile, you can see those scales sticking up. And now you can just about make that out in this top example here. And the other two, if they've got sort of crests on there, but they're just not these, these really quite marked erect patches of scales on the, on the thorax. So early underwing, even, even some of the more worn examples still have got that crest running down the thorax and it just looks like a Mohican haircut. Turnip, on the other hand, turnip, unless it's a female turnip, turnip comes in all sorts of kind of morphs, if you like, is, is that Quite often, if they're well marked, uh, they're, they're relatively easy to identify by having a, a short dart mark um, and a pale gray, um, outer edge to the wing. So, so the uh, so the, the if you look here, here's a dark one. The the uh, the cilia. So those the 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 scales that are on the outer edge of the wing tend to be rather rather paler than the rest of the wing. So those are two good characters to be able to try and identify turnip. But the, the most important thing for the male is the feather of the antenna. And the feathering extends to pretty much halfway and is quite marked. Um, whereas in the other two, you can just see it here, that's a, a filiform antenna. There is some feathering on a dark sword grass, but it's not 
particularly noticeable in comparison with the turnip. But the other thing about the dark sword grass is it's got a kind of a, a, a visor marking. It's got this dark, uh, just above the eyes, it's got this sort of dark band just above the eyes before it turns into the crest. And you can sort of see uh, in, in from the aerial view, the dark band, you can see the dark band just there in the uh, in the dark sword grass. So, and that isn't present in turnip and it certainly isn't present in pearly underwing. So there are some features, not necessarily using the four wing characters to help you separate these species. Right. Let's do something. How are we doing time-wise? Oh, okay. Um, prominence. But as soon as we get into May, we'll be starting to see prominence. And the bottom three, I don't think you'll have any particular problems with. Coxcomb prominent. Yes, again, it's got a one Scottish form, which I can't show you today. Maple prominent. Maple prominent is a species that's got a very weird distribution, but it's pretty much an, an, an England thing. Um, Let's see, I'll just get my crib out. Well, that's gone. Maybe I haven't got it. Um, but, uh, it it's, it's really a sort of East Anglia, um, Southeast England, a little bit into Central Southern England. And then um, but Y Valley. And then a weird population in North Devon. Um, maple prominent, as the name suggests, feels on field maple, except in North Devon where there is a population that's been there forever and a day, historic population, hundreds of years, associated with sycamore, because field maple isn't really a species of plant that occurs in North Devon, other than planted by local authorities on road verges. But the, the, the native population of maple prominent in North Devon is on sycamore. Scarce prominent is a wonderful prominent. It looks fantastic, um, but you need to go into good birch woodlands to find it. And it's distributed pretty much across the country, but it is very local and confined to those woodlands. The two I think we need to be able to separate with certainty are lesser swallow and swallow prominence. I know many of you will have already got this right, but let's just rehearse it for those who need to know. And that's the shape of the triangle between the outer edge of the wing and the railing edge of the wing. And we're talking about this triangle here. It's a white triangle in the lesser swallow provenance, and it's a gray, uh, whitish gray triangle in swallow prominent. And it's to do with the color and shape of the triangle. So in the swallow prominent, it, it's long and thin and a bit sort of dirty whitish. And in the lesser swallow prominent, it's short and relatively broad and is usually bright white. There's another character that I kind of find sometimes helpful. Well, I suppose there is the other one. Lesser swallow is actually a slightly smaller moth than swallow prominent. But if you've only got one in your hand, that's not very helpful to have a relative character. Is that the color of the leading edge of the wing here? Uh, let's just do it this way here. It's a little bit dirty gray, where in the lesser swallow prominent is usually bright white. That's fine for most of the country, apart from, yes, where? Scotland, where, of course, there's a little bit of dirty grey that comes into some examples in Scotland. Um, but it's the colour and shape of the triangle at the, between the trailing edge of the wing and the outer edge of the wing is the one you're really after. Oh, there we go. Right, in terms of time, got a few more minutes. Let's have a look. I'm just going to do something very brief on micros because why wouldn't I? Um, and that's, I think there's this tendency at this time of the year to see small brown moths and go, yeah, I'm not going to record those. Well, I would urge you to give it a go. And here are, um, was it six species of, of pretty common agonopsis moth um, that occur in moth traps at this time of the year and I think they're okay to identify. Um, so the hemlock moth, Agonoptrix alstromeriana, is, is the smallest of this common group. And it's characterized by this sort of whitish front edge to the wings and the thorax. Um, and the smudge 
of, of uh, dark scales that runs up to the leading edge of the wing. So the, the dots that you can see elsewhere, the smudgy dots, that actually goes right up to the edge of the uh, leading edge of the wing. The Agonoptrix oscillana, the red-eyed buff, the name we've given it, because it's got a red eye. Um, and this one here, that's the red eye we're looking at there. So it's a, a white dot surrounded by reddish scales. And some of them are really quite bright red. And then in front of that, towards the base of the wing, there's often a red dash as well. So that's a relatively easy one to identify and should be doable. Then we've got Brindled Buff, um, Agonoptrix Araneva, um, which I would say was, uh, you know, it's, it's overall, it's got a sort of a yellowish brown look to it. It's always got a black smudge and a couple of black, small black dots ahead of the smudge. And until they get in terrible, terrible condition, they're usually okay to identify. But the overall look of that moth is of a, of a pale yellowish brown with some sort of smudgy cloudings around. The black neck buff most of the time has exactly what it, it, it says, and that has the thorax with black behind the eyes, basically behind the head. It's got a black three quarters of the thorax. It too has the smudge, the smudge with the two black dots, um, but it's it's uh, it's more peppered than than the brindle buff. But it's uh, but it's perfectly identifiable. There are some forms of black buff which do not have the black neck, and those are more similar to brindle's buff. But um, again, it's that telling the difference between what's a sort of a shading and the peppering of the darker marks. Black neck buff is more peppering and the brindle buff is more shading. Postal buff, Agonoptrix yetiana, uh, is also quite similar. It tends to be a bit more slender, but you can see instantly that it's a bit streaky. It's got the, the, the same um, smudge and two dots, um, but, but it's got these streaks leading down, uh, which are effectively their, their black scales down the main veins on the wing, and that gives it that streaky appearance. So that should enable you to separate out those uh, five species. And then we've got the very commonest brown moth in the moth traps at this time of the year, which is common brindle brown, Agonoptrix heracleana, occurs in a gray brown form and a brindle brown form, and then also an impossible to identify form, which is it has no scales. The characteristic of this one is two black dots here, and then two white dots just behind. I don't know whether you can just about see and just get rid of those annotations. Squint hard and you'll see two black dots at, uh, at, a, at an angle and then behind it, two white dots. And that's absolutely characteristic of common brindle brown, which is a very common moth at this time of year, except there is this other species called banded brindle brown, Agonoctic ciliella, which is also around at this time of the year, but I have to say I rarely ever see it in the winter and the early spring. It must be around, but I just don't see it. The one that I see 100% of the time is the common brindle brown. It's called banded brindle brown because the hind wing has got bands in it that are distinct, and it's got five bands that you can count within the cilia, within these, these scales that stick out the... Uh, back edge of the wing. The common brindle brown also has some bands, but you'll struggle to count five of them. But if you can see clearly five bands, and that's a good shout, a band of brindle brown. But look also at the size difference between the, the common one and the banded one. A banded brindle brown is, I would say, 10 to 15 percent bigger. So you're looking for a bigger example in your moth trap. And also, particularly if it's fresh, then, then they've got a pinkish hue to them. So if you've got a pinkish hue to the brown, something that's bigger than the normal one, and it's got the bands, then it will be the banded brindle brown. But I have to say, certainly in recent years in Southern England, I haven't ever seen that coming out in the spring. But it may well be, given the moths around all over the country, there are parts of the country where it occurs in the spring in, in reasonable numbers, but I just don't see it. 
banded brindle brown is most common on wild angelica. So if that's a very common species of plant in your part of the world, then perhaps you're more likely to see it. There is plenty of angelica around where I am, but I just don't see them all. OK, now I think we are probably going to leave it there. That's fine by me because we'll come to those next week. And oh, I think, yeah, should we just do a couple more minutes? Go on, then we'll just do a couple more minutes. Yeah, go on. Go on, we'll just do a couple more minutes. Let's just do some caterpillars because we can't just spend all our time. We are hopefully going to get some sunshine soon. And when we do, we want to get out and walk in the countryside and we will be seeing some large furry caterpillars and we'll want to know how to identify them. The one that we will be seeing, well, I don't know, most often soonest is probably fox moth. This one here characterized by being very black down the sides with these sort of, sort of whitish whitish hairs and and uh, and a, a rich brown on the top um and this caterpillar fox moth has done all the feeding it needs to do so it will be big it will be at least two to and a half inches long and it will be racing around trying to find somewhere to Pupate. So it's finished its feeding. It tends to occur in heathy, acid grassland areas, but not exclusively. You can also find it on downlands, um, coastal areas. Um, it's fox moth is quite a widespread species. And so the caterpillars will be out in March and April and they will be whizzing around looking for them. Above that is oak egger. Now, oak egger is complicated because as well as oak egger, we also have a thing called northern egger. And northern egger has a two-year life cycle, and oak egger has a single-year life cycle. The caterpillar you're looking at there of oak egger is pretty much fully fed, um, and that's going to be around in, mm, I would say, May-June time um, in most of England and Wales, except in northern England, where it all gets a bit mucky and complicated. Um, uh, so that caterpillar, you'll see it's got white dashes down the sides. You see those white dashes? So it's not dissimilar to fox moth. And indeed, the color of the hairs will vary between individuals. Sometimes they're quite light, and sometimes they're at least as dark as fox moth. But when the caterpillar turns, you should see two things. One is the white marks, and the other is these sort of black um, space, these black intersegmental spaces. So between the brown hairy bits, you'll see a sort of a black velvety band. So that's the characteristic of oak egger. Now, if we got more time, I'd tell you about the difference between oak egger in the autumn, which is radically different from how it looks in the spring. It's a, it's a wonderful caterpillar with little red triangles on it, and it just changes over winter. Remarkable. Um, northern egger, so the bits that occur in the, in the, the, the northern England um, moorlands and up into Scotland, at this time of the year, you've got basically got a, a half-fed caterpillar and that, that will be then feeding up in the spring and it's a pupa over the next winter. So it, it's, uh, you know, we don't, so the caterpillar in the two-year life cycle is a relatively modest caterpillar through until the first autumn and then it feeds up in the following spring and then, pu then summer and pupates over the winter. Right. Drinker moth. I think most of us can probably recognize a drinker moth, but the tufts of hairs, you know, it's got this lovely golden speckling down the side of it. These tufts are very characteristic. So you they don't occur on other big hairy caterpillars at this time of the year. And um, drinker moth, we tend to see we're out in the countryside, I don't know, April and May. And then there's a caterpillar still sitting up on a Yorkshire fog leaf or something like that. And you think, oh, yeah, there's a drinker. Yes, you can confidently record it as that. Weirdest of all, actually, is grass egger, which we're not instantly going to see. They start feeding in March and then go through till sort of May time. And grass egger, these have got very isolated populations. And, um, and so if you're down at Dungeness, where grass egger is quite common, the, the, the population of the adult moths look different from other grass eggers in the country. And the caterpillars feed on different plants. So the, pl the plant that they home in on, Dungeness, 
is is the um, free lupin. But if you come along to Hailing Island, for instance, um, they're on, uh, and indeed on um, Dudland, they're on Marram grass, um, and on the Channel Islands, on Guernsey, on the on the cliffs on the south there, they're on prostrate room. And as you go around the country, you find that the populations seem to occur on different plants wherever you are. So it's really quite a, you know, for something where we're looking at big caterpillars that you think, well, these things have got wonderful dispersal abilities. Grass egg seems to be very faithful to particular sites. Anyway, look, I think that's probably enough. I suspect you've probably got other things you might wish to do. Um, uh, uh, I, may I thank you for attending this first section? And also particularly to thank the many photographers who've offered their photos to me and to BC.